This is the human side of healthcare, where we explore all aspects of today's ever changing healthcare environment. Brought to you by the Dallas Fort Worth Hospital Council and featuring CEO Stephen Love with co host Thomas Miller. Now, let's make healthcare human again. And welcome to the human side of healthcare. We're delighted you're with us today. You know, Thomas, the community spread of COVID-19 continues. And you mentioned to me something right before the show about some friends of yours. Well, yes, I have some friends who took an RV trip to go look at fall colors. And Steve, they brought something back with them that they did not leave with. Don't tell me it was COVID-19. Both of them. Wow. And you know, the symptoms were not what we typically hear. Sore throat, respiratory, etc. Their symptoms began as diarrhea. You know, I've heard different doctors say that uh, sometimes these are different symptoms and it becomes respiratory, but not necessarily immediately. So how serious is the wave and what are the hospitals looking at right now? Well, you know, basically we're running about 70% in patients of where we were at our high level in July. So we've gradually increased and we're at 70% of where we were and community spread can go pretty quickly. And what's the forecast from the hospitals? The forecast is they think we're going to continually, gradually go up, but we think if people will intervene and wear a mask, physical distance, wash their hands, we can level it off and start tapping it down. Well, I can tell you from what I've seen trekking through several states that in some places people are wearing masks very compliantly, and in a lot of places they are not. Yeah, that's very unfortunate. We've got to get the message out and try to get people to do it because it's the right thing to do. Let's take a pivot here. We're going to focus on our kids now for the rest of this segment. They're back in school, but some are in virtual and some are in the classroom. And some kids have not been playing as much as they were before COVID-19. And that can lead to sports and play-related injuries. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Absolutely. And unfortunately, when you have sports, you have injuries. We're delighted we've got Dr. John Christopher Reddy with us today. John is the sports medicine physician and orthopedic surgeon at Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital in Allen. John, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me here. It's my honor. Well, you know, as Thomas and I were just saying, fall sports are in full swing. What would you say are the most common sports-related injuries? Well, my partners, Drew Parker and Katie Kester and I at Texas Health Sports see lots of injuries throughout the year, unfortunately. And of course, most participants in sports don't get injured, but they really come in two varieties. There are traumatic injuries where accidents can create damages to the musculoskeletal system. And then there are the injuries that occur just because of overuse or overtraining. Whether or not the traumatic injuries or the overuse injuries are the most common really depends on the type of sport. And the more contact is involved between players in a sport, the more likely the traumatic injuries would be a bit more common. I guess most of our listeners know that the Dallas Cowboy quarterback Dak Prescott suffered a season-ending injury. It was an ankle fracture and a dislocation. Now, we certainly know you weren't the treating physician, but that type of injury, what is the normal, typical recovery process? When we have an injury to a joint, and that's the part of your limb where two bones meet, when we have an injury to the joint that involves damage that leads to what's called a dislocation where those two bones are no longer articulating with each other in the right manner, there's damages to the ligaments as well as the damage associated with the broken bone that both have to heal in order to recover. Initially, what we need to do is first restore that joint back to its normal alignment Sometimes that requires us even to do surgery to hold the bones together if there's a fracture involved. After that time, things have to heal, and once the healing of the bone and the joint occur, then the real work begins for the athlete when they need to restore the mobility and the explosiveness to that limb in order to ultimately get back to sport. You know, it's hard to predict every sports injury, but what would you say 
that you would advise our listeners related to tips to avoid sports injuries? Getting out there and playing sports may be one of the most healthy things that we get involved with. It helps us live better and it helps us live longer. But certainly we want to do everything we can to be able to go back and play another day. And I think the first tip would be to get plenty of rest and recovery after your sports outings and make sure that you have the proper guidance on what to eat and getting all of the good uh, warm-up and cool-down instructions from an exercise professional like a certified athletic trainer or a physical therapist can really be helpful for athletes to maintain the flexibility, balance, and agility to perform sports safely. And maybe the last and most important thing is to know the difference while we're playing sport between what a normal, strenuous, muscular-related symptom that is really okay to play through might feel like and what a deeper pain that causes us to limp or really fear further participation because of the pain. And that's a bad pain where we need to stop and pull ourselves out before things get into trouble. You know, during this pandemic, COVID-19 has spread throughout the community. And we hear about, you know, athletic teams where the athletes get it. If someone should have a sports injury and get hurt, should they wait or be hesitant to go see someone like you during this COVID-19 pandemic? The COVID-19 pandemic has had effects on our human lives in ways that we're only still beginning to learn. But one of the things that's clear is that if we suffer from an injury that is causing lack of ability to get around, to have our quality of life, there would be no available evidence to suggest we should stay away. Rather, we should seek treatment so that we can stay mobile and stay healthy. And in fact, one of the great victories of the pandemic has been the emergence of the virtual visit, where we can even talk to patients over their own smartphones in the safety of their home and really direct them to what the next appropriate steps are at no risk whatsoever due to the virus. You know, when people do have a sports injury and they come to you for the clinical treatment, are there any services or special programs that Texas Health Sports Medicine offers for these athletes after they've been treated so they can return safely to their sport? One of the things that brought me to the Texas region after serving for 12 years as the lead center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, was the absolute cutting-edge nature of Texas Health Sports Medicine, starting with the board-certified, evidence-based surgeons and physicians that can guide the care, but really also extending into the rehabilitative excellence where our physical therapists are specializing not only in the treatment of individual athletes, but they have a strong record of publication of their biomechanic analysis of those athletes and using the best available sciences to not only get them back safely, but as quickly and as effectively as modern science will support for athletes of any level. We're talking to Dr. John Christopher Reddy from Texas Health Allen here on the human side of healthcare, obviously about orthopedic athletic injuries. We're going to continue this conversation when we come back. In the meantime, let me remind you of our podcast. All of the interviews that we do don't all make it on the air, but they do make it to our podcast. If you search any major podcast players for the human side of healthcare, we are there. More with Dr. John Christopher Reddy talking about preventing and treating sports injuries when the human side of healthcare returns. This is the human side of healthcare on 1080 KRLD and the radio.com app, where we feature healthcare's hottest topics and what our North Texas area hospitals are doing to make healthcare human again. And welcome back. We are continuing our conversation now with Dr. John Christopher Reddy. He's with Texas Health Presbyterian Allen and is an orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine physician. Let's assume that you've got children or teenagers playing a pickup game of football or flag football in the backyard, so there's no formal sports trainer there. If you hurt yourself or sprain your ankle, should our listeners put heat on that? Or should they put cold compresses on that? Well, there's no doubt that for all of us, especially with Thanksgiving approaching and the old turkey ball about to happen, we have a lot of friends and family that will gather and want to play sports in local settings that really aren't on an official field. And there's a really very helpful acronym or, or series of letters that stand for something called RICE. Rest, ice, 
compression, and elevation. And anytime we get into sports-related participation, when we don't have a sports medicine professional around, it's always safest to follow those simple rules. If you've twisted your ankle, you take the weight off it and rest it. You place ice, not directly on the skin, but uh, through the use of an ice pack that's approved for placement on the skin. And then you compress this with a light uh, sock or wrap, and you elevate it while you wait to get better attention. That's great advice, and that's good for our listeners to know, especially, as you say, around Thanksgiving when we have those pickup games. Thomas, what questions do you have? Well, I, I could parlay right on that one that you just asked. If you have an injury at home, how could you presumptively tell a break possibly from a strain? Often we're asked by friends and family as sports medicine physicians, Doc, do I have to go in and get an x-ray or not? Is this just a minor thing or do you think I might have a fracture? Now, unfortunately, no one can really completely predict from outside the skin without the value of an x-ray whether a bone could be broken because a break sometimes leads to the bone moving into several pieces when other times it's more just like a crack in the ice that hasn't really separated a uh, one one from the other yet however some really common things that we can keep in mind are if we see large amounts of swelling if we're unable to put our full body weight onto an area and if this is occurring away from the joint or in the middle of the bone itself we might be more suspicious for a fracture however when we're dealing with the soft tissues of the body or in the region of the joints themselves and we're able to press on the soft areas and those areas are not painful these are other ways for us to think about the bones themselves when they're when they're broken and then when would you advise people we talked about the ice packs but what about immobilization splints and that kind of thing one of the challenges for the lay person or for a regular person in the community about deciding when do i go to that next step and put a brace or an immobilizing device on my limb is that braces and immobilizing devices aren't exactly completely harmless. Once we stop uh, uh, moving our limbs and we apply braces to them, the blood flow from those limbs can maybe not work as it should normally, potentially leading to blood clots or other problems of being immobilized. The basic tip that I think everyone should follow is if they feel they might wonder about needing to wear or put on some immobilizing brace or splint, that's a great sign that they should get some professional help and decide what to do next. Yeah, because that is an important, very important area, isn't it? It's extremely important, and uh, the protection of your limbs and, and anything that threatens the mobility of your limbs is really what it's all about to be a part of a, a sports medicine team to help patients through that problem and move back on towards what they need to do in life. You know, there's... Um something that you're just not going to ever get out of Texas, and that is kids football, <laughs> right? We start them young, and we, uh, right. as parents, we all have the next quarterback uh, in at our favorite college team. I'm not going to mention any, but <laughs> get, in, get in big trouble <laughs> there, right? That's safe, yeah. But what do you advise? How would you, you know, if you had a, a parent that was asking, should I let my four-year-old play uh, pad padded tackle football. What would you say? No, oh, I think that the, I think that the, the, the desire to participate in sports is a universally controversial decision to some. But for me, I keep it as simple as possible. I think every time a parent is deciding whether or not they should allow their child to participate, the most important thing to do is to make sure that all family members involved both parents, if it's a two-parent family, everyone should be involved with that decision. And the first thing that they should do is put the well-being of their children, not only in the short term, but in the long term, out and open for discussion, and then go ahead and make the decision that feels right to them. I got a phone call one afternoon. It was from my son, and he said, Dad, I hurt my leg playing lacrosse this afternoon. And they say that there was a pretty loud pop. He had obviously snapped his ACL. And there were some decisions around whether to operate because he was at that critical age where his growth plates had not closed yet. Can you just give us a little mini seminar on what parents of kids of that early teenage might face if they have a fracture like that? Inside orthopedic surgery, 
it is a very broad field. And as a member of university faculty for memory, many years, we know that certain of our colleagues are going to focus on the health of the growing bone or the growth plate. And the, and the, and the medical word for that is the physis. And so there are a whole specialist community out there called pediatric orthopedic surgery. And the most important thing about that extra added qualification for pediatric orthopedic surgery is their extremely careful consideration of not only what are the effects of the injury on this human being today, but as that bone is about to go grow and be a larger or more angular part of the full adult skeleton, might this injury impact growth into the future? And this is the reason why my practice is focusing on late adolescence and adult uh, injuries where the growth plates have already closed, but I really highly value my colleagues and have strong relationships in the pediatric community to help parents make decisions about that growing bone. Yeah, that's a big decision for parents of school-age kids. Let me throw the question back the same way to more mature adults. Let's say you're out skiing and you uh, mess up your ACL or MCL. Is that something that you need to get fixed, or is there an age where you might just let it go? This day and age, the word age is a really, really hot topic. Back in the late 1990s, we might have seen a certain age where if you're out skiing and you hurt your knee or you hurt your shoulder, someone said, you know, you just may be over the hill. It's time for you to just hang them up. Nowadays, we don't use age as an independent factor. We think that people who want to live in a vital manner and they can maintain their fitness, they do deserve all the opportunities to be restored back to their full function so they can go back out and tackle the mountain however they'd like to do it. And as a surgeon on that end, how do you tell or what do you advise patients about the importance of really doing the rehab right? Well, no matter what age you are, the first step is getting the right diagnosis when you've got something that shuts you down. You've got to get the right diagnosis. The second step, if we have a surgical injury and we've been doing surgery now for about 15 years, there's no doubt that the surgical technique steps are very important, but I do believe that no matter what level of sport you're talking about, it's the effort of the patient and their physical therapist after that surgery that makes all the difference in their ultimate success. I like to think of it like this. As a surgeon, I'm really the navigator, and the patient is flying that plane, and their therapist is their co-pilot, and my job after the surgery is to help them chart their way to ultimate success, but no doubt the patient themselves is steering that ship. Thank you, Dr. Christopher Reddy. Some very great points on how to avoid sports injuries. Now we're going to pivot real quick. Steve, hospitals in the news again, but this time not COVID-19. What's going on? Well, you know, Thomas, this week, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Health and Human Services put a warning out about a ransomware attack that could happen anywhere in any hospital. There are some cyber criminals out there that have decided they want to go after hospitals and they put ransomware and it scrambles your data. It really makes it kind of like gibberish to be candid. And then you have to pay a ransom to get a software key to open it up. And in some cases, they're demanding as much as $10 million per target. And Thomas, this is really serious. Not only does it hurt the hospital, it can kill patients. In Dusseldorf, Germany, last month, an IT system failure because of ransomware caused a critically ill patient to die. Any idea who's behind it or what they're going to do about it? Well, you know, that's a great question. The federal agencies were careful not to point the finger but they said all of their intelligence came from a Russian-speaking crime gang. And the local hospitals on alert and prepared? Oh, absolutely. No question about it. They're on top of it. Their security officers are. And we've put together a way that we communicate so that we share any unusual or suspicious activity. Now, when we come back, there's what we call a thief in the night that can steal your sight. What are we talking about? That's next on the human side of healthcare. We'll be back right after this quick break. 
The DFW Hospital Council, along with our over 90 member hospitals in North Texas, are proud to bring you the human side of healthcare with Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co host Thomas Miller. And welcome to the human side of healthcare. We're delighted you're with us today. As you know, we talk about many things that impact our listeners. And there's one thing that some people may not know a lot about, and we want to help you learn about it today. It deals with your eyes. It deals with your vision. It's glaucoma. We have with us Dr. Davinder S. Grover, who's a glaucoma specialist, and he's an ophthalmologist with Glaucoma Associates of Texas. Dr. Grover, thanks for being on the show. Well, Steve, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and um, share my opinions and thoughts about something that I care tremendously about, which is glaucoma. Well, for our listeners out there, can you explain what glaucoma is and how is it treated? Whenever I speak about glaucoma, I, I think it's important to take a step back and kind of really define kind of just what it is. And because uh, I feel like oftentimes patients will say they may have it or they hear about it, uh, but there's a lot of confusion on what it actually is. So what I when I first meet a patient, I say, well, let's talk about glaucoma. So what is glaucoma? And glaucoma fundamentally is a disease of the eye that leads to blindness. And it's actually a, the number two leading cause of blindness in the world. Um, and it's related to the pressure in the eye. And when the pressure builds up, it damages the nerve that connects the eye to the brain called the optic nerve. And it can lead to loss of nerve tissue, which can eventually lead to loss of vision. Now, the, there are probably a lot of factors that go into the different types of glaucoma. But the key thing to remember and is the only thing we can change, the only what we call modifiable risk factor, is the eye pressure. And the way we treat glaucoma is by lowering the pressure. But fundamentally, to take a step back, glaucoma, number one, it's a disease of the eye. It's related to the pressure in the eye. It's a disease specifically of the nerve that connects the eye to the brain called the optic nerve. And, uh, and it's actually the number two leading cause of blindness in the world. So to our listeners out there, do they have any types of symptoms or anything that would even trigger a thought, hey, I may have a problem here. I better see an ophthalmologist. That's one of the most uh, frustrating components of glaucoma is the fact that it's known as the sneak thief of sight or uh, the vast majority of types of glaucoma actually do not have any symptoms in the early and medium stages. In the advanced stages, then patients notice that they don't see as well. Their vision may be a little cloudy or, 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 or hazy. But what's, what's frustrating about this disease is that really there are no symptoms and what the best way to screen for glaucoma which is still not a perfect mechanism but the best way we can screen for glaucoma is based on certain risk factors family history history of trauma in the eye uh, now there are some specific types of glaucoma that do have symptoms uh, that's more of the kind of acute or sudden onset types of glaucoma where the pressure in the eye shoots up to a high level and the patient has a painful red eye with tearing but the vast majority of glaucoma uh, has no symptoms and um, by the time the patients actually notice it it's actually usually almost towards the end stage and we've already lost a lot of the nerve tissue so you know the best time to catch it is early and my what one statement i always tell my patients especially when we can catch it early is that i want them to think that glaucoma is just some disease that i've made up and it never impacts their life for the rest of their life it never impacts their vision because the other thing we do know about glaucoma is that when it's caught early and treated appropriately, we win 95% of the time. You know, as you were answering that question, it, it really crosses my mind. Many times you talk to people and they'll go, yeah, I see my dentist regularly. Or women get breast exams regularly. Men get their PSA checked regularly. Should people routinely see an ophthalmologist because of these symptoms that could be there and they not realize it? Without question. I think a regular eye exam by an ophthalmologist, someone with an MD, is a, is a very important thing to do. And, and in fact, our national society, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, recommends an annual eye exam with an ophthalmologist for everyone over the age of 40. 
Uh, now, if you have any family history of, of eye conditions, be it glaucoma or other eye problems, if you have a family, if you have a history of trauma to the eye or infection of the eye or inflammation of the eye, uh, that would warrant an eye exam possibly sooner. Uh, if you have other health conditions such as diabetes, uh, it is important for you to get a regular eye exam by an ophthalmologist uh, slightly sooner. But our National Society, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, uh, recommends that anybody over the age of 40 get a baseline ophthalmic exam. And typically, that your ophthalmologist, when they see you, uh, he or she will recommend either an annual exam or possibly uh, an exam every other year. But a good baseline eye exam at the age of 40 is an essential thing. You know, glaucoma, I know, is treated when you use sometimes eye drops to help control, uh, as you call it, the intraocular pressure, IOP. But when that doesn't work, sometimes you have to do surgery. I understand Glaucoma Associates of Texas invented a special glaucoma surgery that is now spread around the world. Can you elaborate on that? I'd be, I'd be happy to. Yeah. So, you know, Steve, as you importantly pointed out, uh, the treatment of glaucoma is, is by lowering the pressure, and we do that with medication, laser, or surgery. And um, back in 2011, myself as well as my partner, Ron Fellman, and all my partners at Glaucoma Associates of Texas, we were the first ones in the world, uh, Dr. Fellman and I were the first ones in the world to perform this surgery that we named the GATT surgery, the G-A-T-T surgery. To understand the, the nuances of this surgery, I like to kind of take a very take a step back and talk about kind of simplistically the, the features of the eye and, and what glaucoma does. So I tell my patients I'm basically a fancy plumber of the eye. The eye is like a drain in a faucet. It makes water and it drains water. And this is all fluid within the eye. This has nothing to do with tearing. There's a mesh over the drainage system, no different than in your sink, uh, that's called the trabecular meshwork. And that mesh, we think, is almost always implicated in uh, various types of open angle glaucoma. And what we did in 2011, and you know, Ron Fellman, my senior partner, he was kind of the, the, the mental genius behind this idea, was we know how to open up that meshwork by making it some certain incisions on the outside of the eye to get access to the inside of the eye. And that usually takes, you know, anywhere from 45 to 60 minutes, and it's slightly in, uh, involved and a little bit invasive. And uh, what we did in October of 2011 was we found a way to do the same exact surgery. It's called a trabeculotomy. It's where you remove the meshwork 360 degrees around the eye. And we found a way to do that through two small incisions. Um, so it's much less invasive, much safer. And it's literally a, it's a modification of a surgery that's been around for 60 to 70 years. What's more important uh, in my mind is that it also uh, it can be performed with a suture that costs maybe three or four dollars. And it is um, becoming what I think the gold standard treatment for certain types of glaucoma around the world in a cost effective and safe way. That is amazing. That is simply amazing. What a, as you say, a Dallas homegrown technique. I'm going to pivot just a little bit. When you see a patient and you run the necessary test and then you decide, yes, I think this is a diagnosis of glaucoma, what do you tell your patients? Well, some of the best education I've ever had as a physician is when I'm on the receiving end of healthcare. And as a physician, anytime I've ever been a patient, it has made me a better doctor. And, and it allows me, I think, to, to communicate better with my patients when I do everything I can to imagine what it feels like to sit on their side, uh, in their chair. And what I've realized uh, over the, the past 10 years is the first thing that all they're thinking about when they come in my office is, oh my goodness, I'm going blind, I, I have glaucoma, I'm not going to see my son graduate. I'm not going to see my daughter have a child. I, and, and their mind just goes off and off and off on these tangents because it's such a scary idea uh, to lose vision and to have glaucoma. So I keep that. That's a very real thing that I, I carry every time I see a patient. 
And so when they're distracted by these thoughts and these fears, the first thing I tell them when it's appropriate, and usually thankfully it is, is that I say, you know what, sir, you have glaucoma, but you're not going blind. And, and I get that out of my mouth immediately. And I see that physical relief in them when those words come out of my mouth. That's the, I try to get that out of my mouth as quick as possible. Say, ma'am, uh, you have glaucoma, but you're not going blind. We're going to win. And the minute I say that, you can just see their shoulders come down. Sometimes, you know, they tear up. Sometimes they, they cry. They take a deep breath. And then they're open to listening. I could go into my whole spiel on, on what glaucoma is and how it's treated and, and all these things. But unless those words come out of my mouth saying that you're going to be just fine, they don't hear anything. And so that's really, in my mind, one of the most important things, uh, obviously when it's appropriate, to say, uh, to let them know that, we can, that we're going to win and that we're going to treat this appropriately, uh, that they're in the right place, that this is all I eat, live, and breathe, and I've dedicated my life to this, and, um, and that if treated appropriately with a, a dedication and a persistence, and that this is a path we're going to go on together, and this is a lifelong battle. But when it's caught early or treated appropriately, we win, and I expect them to keep good vision for the rest of their lives. So I think it's important um, to, to really instill that relief and that level of hope uh, because it's a very scary thought to have a condition that is a potentially blinding disease. You're listening to Dr. Davinder Grover from Glaucoma Associates of Texas talking about the thief in the night, as he said, the silent thief that can steal your sight, glaucoma. This entire interview is on our podcast called The Human Side of Healthcare, obviously, and it's on all the major podcast players. And this topic is getting ready to get real personal in the next segment. Stay with us. We'll be right back on The Human Side of Healthcare. We're continuing our conversation on how you can empower yourself to have the best health possible in today's ever-changing healthcare environment. This is The Human Side of Healthcare with DFW Hospital Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co-host Thomas Miller. And welcome back. We're continuing our conversation with Dr. Davinder Grover of Glaucoma Associates of Texas. And one of the reasons that this subject is so important to us to be sharing with you is that for a long time, Steve Love has actually been living with glaucoma. Steve, would you tell your story? Sure, I'll be glad to. Uh, full disclosure to listeners, my mother had glaucoma, and at age 23, I was seeing an ophthalmologist regularly, as Dr. Grover said, a family history. And yes, my IOP, the intraocular pressure, started elevating. And for a series of years, I saw different ophthalmologists because as I got out of college and took different jobs, I moved around, and it was pretty consistent. Uh, it was some form of medication, an eye drop, an eye gel, et cetera, that I used. I moved to the DFW area in 1999, and a couple of years later, the medications just really began to not work well. So I actually went to Glaucoma Associates of Texas and had surgery performed. And I don't mind telling you, I'm under the care of Dr. Grover, and he gives me excellent care. But those of you out there, going back to what he said, I was 23, and I'm certainly not 23 now, but at age 23, I was diagnosed, and I'm in good hands now, and I have good vision, and I'm very thankful for the ophthalmologists that have treated me, but I'm also thankful for the continuing breakthroughs and medication. So, Thomas, that's kind of my journey with glaucoma. Well, that is amazing. And Steve is a couple of miles north of, of age 60. And I'll tell you from personal experience working with him, he puts on reader, reader glasses when he needs to see something up close. Other than that, he has great vision. So, what you're saying is absolutely true. I mean, you've lived with it all these years, and what a great testimony to the care you've received. Absolutely. Uh, there's been so much, I mean, in, seriously, in the last 45 years, it's just unbelievable, the great continuing treatment of the eyes, not just glaucoma. Uh, and ophthalmology and the work of the ophthalmologist, not only here in Dallas, but throughout the world, is just tremendous. 
So, Dr. Grover, what? let's pivot. What happened? Tell us your side of Steve's story. You know, it's what's fascinating about glaucoma, um, and I think it's what drew me to it, is that there are the quote-unquote classic types of glaucoma that happens when you get older. Over the age of 65, you're at a higher risk of getting glaucoma. But you can see glaucoma at every age group. And the youngest baby I've ever operated on with glaucoma was a six-day-old baby. And the oldest was a 94-year-old lady. And I, I treat the whole spectrum. And because we don't understand all aspects of glaucoma still, I mean, there's a tremendous amount we've learned. We know how to win. We know how to treat glaucoma. But just as with everything, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And the reason why I went into glaucoma is, one, the impact it has in the U.S. as well as overseas. Uh, and number two, the treatments that we had were so imperfect. And, and there's a, the, one of the more traditional types of glaucoma surgeries is something called a trabeculectomy. And that's kind of a, when you actually make a slightly large incision in the eye and you make a flap. And, uh, and then you create an external drainage system of the eye. And it is one of the bread and butter gold standard surgeries that has been around for 70 years. But it puts a patient at a lifelong risk for infection and it can lead to other complications. And so the big revolution, especially it's actually been in my career over the past 10, 15 years, have been trying to find ways to not have to do that surgery, trying to find ways to do procedures that are less invasive, more predictable, and don't put a patient at a lifelong risk for infection. Or there's another type of broad category of glaucoma surgeries where we have to put a large tube shunt in the eye, and that is associated with the risk of double vision or just having a, a foreign body in your eye. And so what we focused on is, is we're really challenging ourselves as a society. Like I mentioned before, I always treat my patients the way I'd want to be treated or the way I'd want my family to be treated. And so one of the things I always like to ask myself is what would I want if I had glaucoma? And if I needed glaucoma surgery, what would I want? And, and I've dedicated my, you know, my professional life to coming up with surgeries and techniques and instruments. You know, we, we, we invented the GAT surgery. Uh, Dr. Fellman and I have also developed other types of techniques and instruments over the past 10 years to come up with newer surgeries that are safer, more efficient, uh, less invasive that I would want for my eye or I'd want for my family. You know, there are, there are two different types of doctors, and I learned this from one of, my, one of my colleagues. He always used to say, you know, there are two types of doctors. There are doctors that kind of follow the standard of care, and then there are physicians that set the standard of care. And one thing I, I think we pride ourselves at Glaucoma Associates is that we spend every day of our lives as physicians to try to be leaders in the field and try to establish what we think is the standard of care for glaucoma and glaucoma management. Wow, that is an amazing concept. Truly, you are a leader. To our listeners out there, Dr. Grover, how can they obtain more information related to glaucoma? There are a variety of resources to, to get more information about glaucoma. Uh, one of the first and easiest steps is to, is to go to our website, www.glaucomaassociates.com. Uh, we have a, a tremendous amount of information. Uh, there are a couple very reputable national organizations that are a great source of information. One is our National uh, Association for Glaucoma. It was just called the American Glaucoma Society. And they can just go to any search engine and search for that. And uh, there's a, a large amount of information for that. As well as our National uh, Society, the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Uh, and there's a, a website called iSmart. And that is uh, a great resource for patients to get information on all different types of eye conditions, glaucoma, as well as other eye conditions. So thankfully, there is no shortage of resources given the, the Internet with our practices website, the American Glaucoma Society's website, and the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Thomas, we've had some great guests on our show today, but I got to tell you, I'm still concerned about the spread of COVID-19 in North Texas. You know, we want our freedom. We want our economy back, but we want it to be safe. And that's what we're having to figure our way through. And it seems like maybe we've become so COVID fatigued that maybe we're letting our guard down a little bit. What we have to do is remind our family, our friends, our neighbors, 
prevention, prevention, prevention. Wear a mask, wash your hands, physical distance, get your flu shot. I know it sounds like I'm repeating myself, and I am, but those are tools that truly work. Well, you know, we've talked about I've been on this road trip, and I've seen both things. I've seen places where I've not seen one mask being worn. And then you go to other places, and I would say that 90% of the people are wearing a mask. But there are places, Steve, where it's as though they just don't care and they are not wearing masks. Uh, You're correct. And, you know, I think early on that might have been more sparsely populated rural areas. But, for example, I'm looking at the numbers this week. We have more people in the hospital for COVID-19 in Grayson County than we have in Denton County. You know, you've used the term wave. What do you think would be the motivation for people to really take this seriously? You know, I think if we go back and remember what John Barry told us about the great influenza and what happened in the fall and what happened in the winter, that's when the most people unfortunately died. So that was a horrible time. We don't want to repeat that. Absolutely. And that season is upon us. Your guess as we kind of wrap everything up here, are we going to be able to contain this or is this a wildfire? You know, that's an interesting concept. One of my good friends who's a physician does call it a forest fire. He doesn't call it a wildfire. And he said it's going to continue to burn until we tap it and control it. And we know what we have to do to tap it and control it. And if we do that, then we can keep the economy open. We can keep the schools open. That absolutely is our all mutual goal. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again next week on the human side of healthcare on 1080 KRLD and radio.com.